Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's discussion around what developers need to know about compliance. My name is Kiara Columbi. I'm with the team at Tonic.ai. And for those of you who may not be familiar yet with Tonic, we are the fake data company. We enable development teams around the world to use safe quality test data based on their production data. So today we're excited to tackle a question that often comes up with our customers and more broadly in the data synthesis space as well. And that's the challenge of compliance. Uh, to that end, it is my great pleasure to introduce you to today's speaker who will walk us through all that we need to know. Justin Webb is a data privacy and cybersecurity attorney and the chief information security officer at the law firm Godfrey & Kahn. He brings over a decade of legal experience in the data security space, and he holds a certification as an information privacy professional from the IAPP. He also has a background in computer science and systems programming. Um, if you don't already follow him on LinkedIn, I highly recommend it as a way to keep your finger closely on the pulse of the data privacy space. We're very grateful to have him speaking with us today. And as always, we welcome your questions. Uh, please feel free to ask them at any time. You can put them in the Q&A or in the chat. I'll keep my eyes out for them and I will ask them uh, of Justin as they come up. With that said, I will pass things over to Justin. Thanks, Kiara. Um, hey, everybody. So um, the, the presentation today is about um, compliance. And um, I think, uh, what we're really talking about is data privacy regulations and data privacy compliance. So um, the agenda for today um, will be an overview of today's data privacy regulations, and there are a lot. Um, so I'm going to cover those sort of at a high level and talk about um, things that are consistent across those regulations, and then talk about sort of ways in which um, in the development process you can uh, get away from those privacy regulations and potentially um, engage in development and do other sort of technology um, efforts without having lots of the risks associated with those privacy laws um, and what those problems you're solving for are. So why would you want to de-identify data? Why would you want to practice data minimization? We'll talk about that um, in the context of development. Um, and I may have a few comments at the end, you know, obviously in production environments and other places, you may need to use personal information. And so if you do, um, we'll talk a little bit about sort of privacy by design, um, which is a big theme um, in data privacy regulations, including GDPR um, and how you can do that. And, and we have a section at the end on Q&A. Um, and just a reminder, um, please ask questions at any time. Um, you can interrupt. Um, I'm happy to take those questions. I think it makes for a better flow. So um, feel free to cut me off and ask a question at any point in time um, or put it in the chat um, and Kiara will help us to answer those. So let's start out by talking about data privacy regulations today. Um, there are a lot. Um, and on this slide, I've kind of just laid out um, the major data privacy regulations that are sort of out there. Um, and number four, the Colorado Privacy Act is something that's actually not been passed yet um, or signed into law by the governor um, of Colorado, but it actually was passed by the legislature. It's certainly coming. Um, and I'll just start from left to right. Um, I think a lot of people are familiar with, at least in a general sense, the California Consumer Privacy Act. Um, which went into effect in 2020 um, and really focuses on allowing people rights over their data, the right to access it, the right to delete it, um, and also allowing people to opt out of the sale of their personal information. Um, the other big sort of beast in the privacy space is the GDPR, which is the General Data Protection Regulation. It's the law that covers all of Europe um, until a little bit ago when um, the UK left um, the European Union. Um, and now there's GDPR and the UK Data Protection Act, um, but they both sort of cover the same thing. Um, and the reason why we care about a European privacy law um, is a couple of reasons. One, we're sort of in an interconnected world um, and therefore laws in other jurisdictions will apply, especially if you're running a technology company um, or doing development where it's gonna be um, a worldwide platform. The other reason is that GDPR has what's called extraterritorial effect which means that even if you're sitting in the United States, um, if you're developing a product that's targeted at individuals in the EU, then you're covered by the GDPR potentially. Um, and so um, when it first came out in uh, 2018 or went into effect in 2018, there was a lot of panic before that. Companies trying to comply with it. Um, and the most important thing about it is, as I'll talk about later, it covers all personal information, not just you know, social security numbers and, and driver's license numbers and financial information, but 
names, email addresses, uh, phone numbers, et cetera. Um, the most recent um, entrant into sort of the US um, privacy space is the Virginia Consumer Data Protection Act, um, which was passed this year. Um, it's narrower than the CCPA. Um, it doesn't go into effect until 2023, but it contains a lot of CCPA-like provisions. So um, allowing people to opt out of sales of personal information, um, providing adequate privacy notices, which every law on this list requires, um, requires you to be transparent and tell people about the information that you're collecting and what you do with it. Um, the Colorado Privacy Act, like I mentioned, passed by the legislature, likely to be signed by the governor um, in probably the next few days. Um, and um, it kind of looks a little bit like um, CCPA and GDPR. Um, it does have sort of the opt out of sale of personal information in CCPA, um, but it uses phrases like um, in GDPR, like processor and controller. Um, <clears throat> it re requires a whole bunch of other stuff. In, and in 2024, it actually requires you to be able to opt out of certain processing of personal data. And then the last one I wanted to mention, um, it's not so new, it's actually a really old law, um, but if you are uh, a plaintiff's attorney, uh, you love this law. It's the Illinois Biometric Information Privacy Act. Um, and the reason why I say that is there's been a ton of litigation around this law. And what the law effectively says is you can't collect biometric information of Illinois residents without obtaining their consent and having a policy that describes how you collect that information. Um, and the way people have been getting in trouble on that law is collecting, um, let's say, fingerprint scans from their employees when they clock into their time clock um, or using that um, as an uh, access point into the company. So I have to scan my thumb when I go in and out of the building. Um, and those entities didn't have a policy about what they do with that biometric information and they didn't obtain consent. And they've been, uh, plaintiff's attorneys have been getting multi-million dollar settlements um, for failing to comply with the law. So that's kind of the landscape. There are all kinds of nuances um, for each one of these laws, but I wanna talk about them just generally um, and the concept of data privacy. If there's one of these laws that applies to you and you wanna ask additional um, questions, feel free. I'm a wealth of knowledge in most of these laws um, and I'm happy to answer any questions. Um, but the common themes across, across data privacy legislation are a few things. Um, the first is that the definition of personal information is incredibly broad. So um, it's not, like I said, just sensitive information. It could just be name or address or name and email address. Um, and I think that's a sea change for us in the United States where we typically think of you know, personally identifiable information um, as something more. Um, and the CCPA goes even farther um, and says that personal information includes information about households. So if you've ever gone online to Zillow or to another website that says, you know, like this address has a particular income, like a household income of X, Y, Z, you know, in a range, or um, there are certain data aggregators who take information and say, people at this address um, are of this particular religion based on their purchases. Um, they like to go green because they bought sort of, you know, solar devices um, and they're between the age range of, you know, 30 to 45 that kind of information would be personal information under CCPA and be protected by the provisions of the law. So um, when you think about these pieces of legislation, think very, very broadly. Um, Can I jump in with a quick question? Sure. Um, that was actually the first I'd heard of the Illinois law. Um, how, one quick question for you is how old is that law? You mentioned it. Um, it's pretty old. I think it was actually passed about 20 years ago, huh. um, but within the past five years, um, I think plaintiffs in their copious amounts of free time um, figured out that they could go after companies. And I think the reason why is that a lot of biometric sort of um, systems have come online. It's much cheaper to have those things. And so um, like Six Flags got sued, mm -hmm. um, a bunch of fast food chains, because a lot of the registers that you use in fast food places have a, a biometric reader um, so that you can open the register and operate it. Um, and so a lot of companies have been caught getting caught in that particular statute. And is biometric information, does that fall within personal information or are they 
to yeah. define differently. So under GDPR and CCPA, everything that's categorized as biometric information under the Illinois statute would be personal information under those other laws and would be treated as sensitive personal information. So stuff about your genes, um, your fingerprint, your retina scan, and there's certain sort of like um, analysis you can do on somebody's walking or gait that can mm -hmm. actually identify you individually. All of those things would be biometric information, including... Um, you know, when Apple does a face scan um, on your device, that's biometric information. But thankfully, Apple doesn't actually have that information leave your phone. So they don't really have to worry about that. But um, uh, but that's sort of the synopsis behind the BIPA. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, and, uh, you know, so for these laws, they generally require that personal information only be used in certain ways. So... Um, you know, the, the concept under privacy is um, it's my information um, and I have a right to sort of decide what people do and don't do with it. Um, under GDPR, um, really, you have to either obtain somebody's consent um, or have a legitimate business interest um, or purpose for using the information. So I can't collect information and process it um, just because I want to. I have to have a good reason or get somebody's consent. Um, under CCPA, there's not as much of a requirement for consent except with respect to minors, um, but I do have the right to opt out of the sale of personal information. I do have the right to know what kind of information you're collecting and what you do with it. Um, and again, on the BIPA side, um, I have to provide my consent for you to collect my biometric information. Um, and you can only do certain things with it. You can only hold it for so long you can't disclose it to third parties unless I allow you to. Um, and under GDPR, it's got all kinds of sort of restrictions um, on what you can and can't do with information. And another big focus has been data aggregators. So Vermont, California, and uh, one other state have um, sort of data aggregator laws now. Um, they're called data broker laws. And effectively, they establish registration requirements if you collect lots and lots of information about people and sell it. Um, there are very large companies like Axiom, LexisNexis, um, Adobe that do a lot of sort of data collection um, and they get caught up in those laws. Um, the other thing that the laws um, require is the data subject rights that I kind of talked about. So um, under all of the laws, you have the right to access um, any personal data that's held about you. Um, under CCPA right now, it's just in the prior um, 12 months. After CPRA, the sort of CCPA 2.0, it will be any, any period of time that you have information. So if you have information back from 1973 about a person, you would potentially need to produce that. Um, you have the right to get your personal information deleted by a particular entity. Um, and that's normally a qualified right. So for example, I can't go to a bank and tell them to delete information about me if they need the information to manage my account um, or if they need to retain it for legal reasons. Um, under GDPR and the new California Privacy um, Rights Act CPRA, I have the right to go to a company and make them correct personal information about me that's inaccurate. Um, especially you can imagine a scenario in which they um, you know, have information about you that relates to your credit that is wrong or your address is wrong. Um, and that's a specific right. And then for a lot of these laws, you have the right to opt out of the sale of personal information. So don't sell my personal information to a third party. Um, and the definition of sale under CCPA is really broad. So it's not like I, um, you know, provide a social security number to Kiara and she hands me back a $1 bill, which is what we would normally think about in like selling personal data. It could be that I give her um, personal data and she gives me back more personal data, right? We're exchanging personal data and it's just something of value. So the definition of sale is exchanging information for something of value under CCPA. Um, it's a little different in Virginia. It's a little different in Colorado. Um, but generally, it means sort of exchanging that information for monetary or valuable consideration. Um, the other theme across these pieces of legislation is they value methodologies to anonymize or de-identify or pseudonymize personal information, which means 
Um, you are not subject to the law in certain and most circumstances if you are using de-identified information, it's anonymized, um, or you're using other strategies to potentially reduce the amount of personal information in your possession or in your control. And that becomes really important in the development side of things um, when you're working in test and dev environments. Um, obviously, you don't want privacy laws applying to you when you're doing testing unless you absolutely have to. Um, and if you're using offshore development teams, obviously, um, it would be great if you didn't have to worry about all the privacy compliance risks. Um, if you're just using de-identified information. Um, the other thing is just quickly to um, add about sort of, you know, common themes are every one of these laws requires you to have a comprehensive privacy policy that talks about what you collect, how you use it, and who you share it with. Um, and to be accurate and transparent about that. Um, they also don't like you using personal information unless you've disclosed that you're gonna use it for that purpose. So if I collect personal information from Kiara and I tell her I'm collecting this information to send her a newsletter, and then I turn around and sell that information to a third party or build a profile about her, um, those the laws do not like that. Um, you need to get the person's consent or um, do something else um, and provide them an updated notice before you can use the information for that purpose. So what we are the have, um, oh, some questions ahead. coming through um, it, along the lines of you know common themes across different different data privacy legislation? Do you more commonly see organizations tailor their data privacy approach to the location of individual users? Uh, or are companies implementing kind of a blanket approach regardless of their location? So if, you know, if they're handling data that is subject to GDPR and they're also hand handling data that is not subject to, data to GDPR, they just treat everyone as though they were subject to GDPR? Yeah, so that's a really good question. And the answer is really mixed. Um, if you're a Google and Amazon or a really large company, they're effectively taking the approach that we will treat all the information the same because they have the resources to program that into their platform and provide data subject rights. Um, for a lot of our clients, um, they're taking, they're breaking it into buckets and saying, this is our EU personal data and we handle that information in a particular way. Um, and this is our California information and we handle it in a particular way based on the law. But the reality, and I'll talk about this in just a second is, these laws aren't going away, they're just getting more and more. And so um, it's we're gonna hit kind of a tipping point when there's enough laws that it just doesn't make sense to break it up into groups anymore and to just start treating all personal data the same and to have a privacy program that hits the high points of any law that's potentially applicable to the company. Okay, yep, that makes sense. One of our attendees says he works in the machine learning space. Is that space? In that space, there is the concept of differential privacy, and I think you're going to touch on this uh, later. Yep. What, if any, are the hard, fast rules around what defines the identified? What are the thresholds? Because differential privacy mutates data in such a way that data distributions across the population are maintained for machine learning purposes. What's the law here? Yeah, so um, I've actually got some slides coming up on exactly how de-identified information is defined under GDPR and CCPA. So I'm going to hold that question until I get to those slides. But there are, at least under CCPA, um, there are specific um, uh, legal requirements for information to be de-identified. Under HIPAA, there are specific requirements. And under GDPR, there aren't specific requirements in the law but there is guidance from what's called the Article 29 Working Party, which is the regulatory um, um, party over GDPR, which now has turned into the European Data Protection Board. But regardless, there are specific sort of guidelines about what um, is de-identified data. And unfortunately, they're not exactly clear. Um, in some instances, there's an open question, but I think for the most part, the answer is you'd rather be in that land um, than in the land of trying to justify why you're sort of using personal information. Obviously, that's not always going to be the case. You have to use personal data, obviously, in production and maybe even in development, depending on the type of thing you're doing. Um, but there are specific guidelines that can help you kind of understand what you're doing um, and whether it fits within the meets and bounds of those requirements. Um, all great questions, by the way. Keep them coming. Um, so... With regard to penalties, um, um, you know, 
GDPR has massive penalties, um, and there was just a story in the Wall Street Journal. There have been a number of penalties that have been issued since 2018. Um, pretty much the fines are can be up to 2 to 4% of your worldwide revenue. Um, so if you're a multi-billion dollar company, you could have uh, considerable fines. To date, the highest fine would be the one that's sort of shown below from the Wall Street Journal, which is $425 million. Um, and then for Amazon, that's kind of a drop in the bucket, to be honest with you, um, of their overall business. But it does, it does have a price. Um, and really what they're going after is people who have data breaches and don't follow the rules um, or tell people about it or they're processing personal information in ways that they didn't describe in their privacy policy or that are just quote unquote shady. Um, under CCPA, um, if you don't follow the regulations, um, it can be $2,500 per negligent violation or $7,500 per intentional violation. Um, but you do have a 30 day period to cure. And what that means is if the, the attorney general of California who enforces CCPA finds that you're not doing something right, you they will send you a notice and you have 30 days to fix it. So the chances of getting fined should be pretty low under CCPA. Um, but after 2023, there is no 30 day period to cure and they can hit you with a fine immediately. So that's something really important um, to get sort of your house in order, especially when 2023 comes um, around because that, that year is when the Virginia law goes into effect, the Colorado law goes into effect, and when CPRA goes into effect. So 2022 should be the year in which you are spending a good amount of time getting yourself ready for all of these new privacy laws. Um, the other thing is that, um, you know, fines under GDPR can be data breach based. Um, under CCPA, there's a specific provision that says if you fail to use reasonable security measures to secure personal information, you can, um, you know, a plaintiff can recover up to seventy-five or $750 per consumer per incident. So if you had 30,000 people whose information was compromised by $750 per person, that could be a lot of money. Um, so the, the answer too is be careful with the information that you do have. Um, I'm going to keep moving along here. So there are other data privacy principles, and I think this will kind of paint around some of the questions that we got asked previously. Um, the first is data minimization. Um, most of these laws um, have a preference for um, using the least amount of personal information necessary to accomplish your purpose. So if you need to send somebody uh, an email newsletter, all you really need to collect is their name and their email address. Um, but if you collect their name and email address and their address and their phone number and a whole bunch of other stuff, you're really not practicing the idea of data minimization. Um, and those laws are under the assumption that you won't collect that information if it's not required for the specific purpose. So when you're designing applications or collecting information, I think um, nowadays, because data is so valuable and everyone wants to monetize it, they want to collect as much as possible. But as these privacy laws become more prevalent, it's actually the opposite. You should be trying to collect the least amount of information to achieve the operational purpose that you're looking for. Um, and you're gonna have a hard time justifying that to a regulator if you're collecting all kinds of stuff that you don't need. Um, the other concept is that data privacy is a human right. Um, GDPR specifically states this um, and says, you know, your right to privacy over your personal information is a fundamental right and you should have control over that. Um, and there are lots of concerns about sort of machine learning algorithms and AI um, where they can have sort of unintended consequences or downstream effects, um, whether it's through automated decision making um, that has implicit bias or that's unnecessarily impeding on privacy rights. Um, you know, depending on how you're training the AI, what personal information you're using and kind of losing control of that a little bit. Um, so uh, the new Colorado law says explicitly in the law that data privacy is a human right. And there are certain state constitutions that say the same thing. Um, but really, it's a, a sea change for the United States. Um, in the United States, we kind of think of, hey, I'm going to collect all this personal information um, and it's mine, right? I own it. It's my data. And these laws really say, nope. The person owns it, they control it, and they can tell you at any time uh, to delete it, to provide them a copy of it. 
um, or uh, to not process it in a certain way. Um, the other big area that's important to know is, at least with respect to GDPR and some other sort of international privacy laws like the Brazilian LGPD um, and others, they are pushing for what's called data localization, which is we want you to keep that personal information in the country from which it originated because we can control and we know that we have laws that protect that information. So for example, the EU does not like the way that US handles personal information because Edward Snowden talked about all of this surveillance that was going on and information collection. Um, we have the foreign the FISA court that can issue subpoenas and, and look for sort of information about uh, data flows across borders. There's, um, you know, the NSA, the CIA, who are collecting large sums of data. Um, and so effectively what the EU has said is that the U.S. doesn't have sufficient privacy and to transfer information from the EU to the United States, you have to have a contract, you have to have adequate safeguards, you have to have supplemental safeguards. Um, and they struck down the most recent sort of privacy shield program that was in place to allow those cross-border data transfers, um, which was called the Schrems II decision, if you haven't heard of it before. But the larger concept is, um, despite having a global sort of universe, um, uh, you know, and global laws, a lot of places want that information to stay in the locale. And so, um, and if it doesn't, then there are all of these privacy compliance obligations that go along with it, contracts, um, certain, you know, security requirements, privacy requirements, et cetera. So you may see a lot of times companies not wanting to move European data out of the EU or, and only process it there. And that's because of these cross-border data restrictions. I have another question that came sure. through, um, and that's in terms of like which companies these laws all apply to. Is there a threshold of company size that, um, or is it just, you know, is there a law that makes it so that anyone collecting data needs to comply? Yeah, so it depends on a law by law basis. But so, for example, under GDPR, it really doesn't matter what size the company is. Um, if you're offering products and services to individuals in the EU and you trip a couple other triggers, or you have um, actual physical locations in the EU or salespeople in the EU, you could be subject to GDPR. Under CCPA, there's actually a revenue threshold. So it only applies to entities that are over $25 million in revenue, or they collect 50,000 pieces of information about California residents or process information. And the other ones normally require, and California CCPA also requires you to do business in California. But that's a pretty easy trigger to meet. If I run an online website and I allow people in California to buy products from my website and I ship it to them, I'm doing business in California, even if I'm not physically present there. Um, same thing with Virginia and Colorado. It requires you to do business in the state and either meet a revenue threshold or um, collect a certain amount of personal information. Mm -hmm. And when you said 50 pieces of information, is that 50 unique pieces of information or 50 unique users? So it'd be, it'd be 50,000 um, individuals. Okay. So like I have okay. information about 50,000 individuals and that could be, I collect it, I process it, I store it, you know, it doesn't matter mm -hmm. um, just that it's 50,000. I think in CPRA, the number gets raised to 100,000. Um, so there's a little bit of a higher threshold because they were trying to protect some small businesses. Um, but the revenue threshold is not that high. Um, and GDPR is sort of the gorilla in the room. Like if you're subject to that, you got to be careful. Um, so one of the other things is, you know, there's more legislation coming. Um, Washington got very, very close to passing a law and then failed for the third year in a row. Um, there are multiple proposals in Texas and New York. Um, and a whole bunch of other places. And so the answer is, this is gonna to continue to happen. And these laws are gonna be different on a state-by-state -state basis, which is gonna make compliance challenging. Um, and so our recommendation is normally, you know, start thinking about having a base level privacy program that hits all the high points of these um, when, when you're focusing on compliance. Um, and then focus on minimizing personal data usage and development, right? You avoid cross-border data issues if you're not actually using personal information. 
you avoid the data breach risk of having that information in like a dev environment or anywhere on systems or having multiple copies of it. Um, you will avoid sort of, you know, privacy oversight from companies that you're working with if you're doing development for a third party. Um, and you also avoid sort of contractual requirements. You don't have to sign a bunch of uh, provisions regarding privacy if you don't get any personal information whatsoever. Um, so you pretty much avoid the privacy law application in the first instance. So we get to the point of, you know, can you achieve the same outcome without personal data and what you're doing? The answer is not always going to be yes, right? But there are ways in which you can try and lower your overall privacy compliance risk as you're sort of working through this process. Um, and so we'll talk about data transformation. Um, and I think there was a question before and we can kind of really get into that now. Um, so what are the requirements for data de-identification um, under uh, CCPA? So what it says is the information cannot reasonably identify, relate to, describe, be capable of, or of being associated with, or be linked directly or indirectly to a particular customer. So that's the first requirement. Um, it can't really describe the person whatsoever. Um, and then you have to have technical safeguards and business processes that prohibit re-identification. And this is another theme that you'll see across a lot of privacy laws. You have to ensure that you're not gonna try and re-identify the data. Um, you also have to have business processes to prevent inadvertent release of the de-identified data, even if it's de-identified data, right? So it's still a, a data set that contains a lot of information um, and you must not make any attempt to re-identify the information. So. This is actually in practice a very hard standard to meet. Um, and, um, you know, there, there are strategies to kind of to, to do that. But the unfortunate thing for sort of de-identification and general data transformation is as the amount of computing power has increased, um, there have been a number of papers written and sort of um, other things that have occurred sort of in the privacy research space that have shown that even for, let's say, census information, um, if you have a big enough computer and enough other outside information, you can potentially re-identify that information back to the specific person underlying the information. Um, and so that's kind of where differential privacy has come into play, which is in addition to kind of having a, a, you know, a large data set, I only allow a certain number of queries to that data set, and I introduce statistical noise into the data set so that I cannot trace back an individual person um, from uh, the, the data set or the results that I'm provided in summary fashion of the underlying data set. So, um, for example, you know, if there are 50 people in the data set um, and I ran one query normally and I could get enough information to know about those individuals or I ran a few queries, <clears throat> if I run a query based on differential privacy, um, I get a bunch of noise in there that kind of moves the, the needle so you can't sort of go on a one-to-one -one basis and work backwards to re-identify people. But one of the gating elements is that I can only make a certain number of requests before the sort of privacy risk gets too high. Um, and um, you have to introduce enough statistical noise so that it can't be re-identified, but not too much that the results are skewed and the value of the underlying information is gone. Um, so that's that's sort of like the one minute description of differential privacy. There's all kinds of math associated with it, all kinds of um, you know research being done on it, and it's actively being used by large technology providers uh, in certain large data sets. Um, so it's, it's getting a lot of work done. It's sort of a buzzword right now. Um, but I think the most important thing, and we'll talk about this um, in sort of the last part of the presentation is when you're designing applications, when you're thinking about technology, um, you want to start with privacy by design and building privacy in from the ground up. So if you have to include personal information in a particular product, you want to... Um, you know, build in potentially data subject controls. So people have the ability to export their data, um, to delete their data, and that's all in an automated fashion. Um, you also want to include um, audit logs so you can kind of tell who accessed what personal data and when. 
Um, and there's and you want to encrypt the personal data as much as possible, both at the storage level and at the field level. Um, and there are lots of other things you can do if you really need personal information sort of in the development process to lower the overall privacy risk. And I can talk about a few of those other things, but this is sort of the outline of what um, de what's required for de-identification under CCPA. Can I ask um, a, a quick sure. question about um, the last bullet on, on that previous slide about yep. the bullet under CCPA that says the business must not make any attempt to re-identify the information. Does that mean that once they've taken the, the, the information, they've de-identified it and they've shared that with another you know, team within the company, is it that that team cannot should not make attempts to re-identify, or is it that the original data has to be you know purged and, and removed from a database? I think it just means any team or any other place in the company okay. should not make any attempt. Now, the interesting thing about this requirement, which I think is kind of silly, is the only way to test to see if you can't re-identify it is to do certain testing on it. Um, but you know you can build that into the front end and have confidence in the algorithm that it's not gonna be re-identified. But I do think it should, really should say you should not make any attempt to re-identify the information other than for confirming like the strength of the, the de-identification. But um, I think if you were doing that, you'd probably be fine. Yeah. Um, and I think that would only be confirming like the um, the, the second bullet point, which is that you have processes and safeguards, right, to, to prohibit re-identification. Yeah. <clears throat> and then on the, oh, went too far. Um, and then on the, the idea of de-identification under HIPAA, um, it gets a little more complicated. Um, and uh, under HIPAA, there, you could have a, a designated record set or a limited data set that's still subject to HIPAA if you, re if you um, remove certain um, identifying information, um, which is not the land that you wanna be in because you still gotta sign HIPAA business associate agreements and comply with all of the requirements under HIPAA. You really want to have truly de-identified information under HIPAA. And there's two ways to do that under um, uh, the HIPAA privacy rule, um, which is the code regulation that I listed out there. Um, you have a person with statistical and scientific experience, apply principles and methods to determine that the risk is small, that the in information could effectively be re-identified or identify an underlying person, and they have to document the methods and results of the analysis that justify the determination. So there's actually a process where you might have to get a st statistician to come in and look at the way in which you've de-identified the data and confirm um, that it's truly sort of de-identified, or you can remove a laundry list of identifiers that are listed out in the statute. The problem is, is that the, the last port of, portion of that requirement is that you remove quote unquote, any other unique identifying number, characteristic or code. Um, and that's can be a very, very hard standard to sort of quantify. Um, and I think a lot of entities in the HIPAA space want the comfort of having um, a report and a document that says, look, we took this methodology and it confirms that um, you know, the information can't be re-identified um, because if, if there's ever a breach or the information gets re-identified outside um, of the universe and you're not treating it as HIPAA protected information, um, having that document really helps you in that process, but they built in these two methodologies because it may not be practical or realistic um, to actually have somebody come in and do this documented analysis um, of the methodology. Um, the caveat to that is once you do this sort of analysis, it should be carried over to sort of other things that you do, right? If you use the same algorithm to de-identify information, um, you know, in this particular instance, and it's a similar data set, the same algorithm should be usable. And so you can potentially use that method and result and analysis in that situation. Um, so it's much more prescriptive under HIPAA, a little bit different. Um, and then the last one I'll talk about is GDPR. Okay, oh, while we're on the subject of HIPAA, I do have a question for you there. Um, yep. And I'm wondering if you could tell us about how it applies or fails to apply to certain tech companies. Uh, specifically, I'm thinking about wearables like Fitbit, fitness apps, or even, you know, there's the Google Nest that's now tracking people's sleep patterns. Yes. 
arguably health data, does this apply? Yeah, so this is sort of like a very complicated area of law, but the, the general answer is HIPAA only applies to um, you know, insurance companies, um, healthcare institutions, um, or places in which you're actually receiving treatment or receiving information about the payment for treatment or diagnosis. Mm -hmm. Um, so, for example, my Fitbit, you know, that's sitting on my arm collects information about my heartbeat, uh, how much I sleep, um, if I enter my weight or other information. None of that would be protected by HIPAA because it has, relates in no way to the treatment of anything. Um, they're not a health institution. They're not, you know, coordinating with my health institution. Same thing with the Nest. Um, but there are regulations from both the FTC and FDA that relate to wearables and just generally mobile health applications. So the answer is there's, a, there's actually a tool that's put out by HHS, um, the FTC and the FDA that walks people and developers through whether or not their app would be subject to HIPAA. Um, and if you change certain things, would it be and what regulations is subject to. It's something I highly recommend if you're sort of developing in that space. Um, the caveat to that would be um, uh, there, there are a bunch of interoperability um, standards under the CARES Act where, um, uh, so for example, Apple now has the option where you can download all your health data to your iPhone from your health system and they're required to facilitate that. Um, but that, that and that information would be subject to HIPAA um, when the hospital shares it with the individual. But if the individual shares it with anybody else, it's not subject to HIPAA anymore because it's disclosed by the person, um, unless they're disclosing it back to an entity that's subject to HIPAA regulations, like a hospital. So if I get my information and then send it to another doctor. Obviously, that information still retains its HIPAA protection. Um, so, like I said, it gets it gets kind of hairy. The other thing that I would say is if you're developing an app that's being used in the treatment or diagnosis of something, um, you potentially um, are subject to HIPAA. So if it's sponsored by a hospital or it interacts with ho hospitals, electronic health record systems, it will probably be subject to HIPAA um, and you'll be a business associate of that institution. And the last thing I'll say on this is uh, you may have noticed like when the Apple Watch came out um, and they had the um, EKG function where you can measure sort of your um, heartbeat and your rhythm, that had to be approved by the FDA um, because that was actually um, considered a medical device under FDA regulations. So there are certain instances in which technology or applications are considered medical devices um, even though they're really just technology. And that's another reason why if you're in that space, go check out the regulations and really understand what you are subject to. Um, but I think the general idea is if it's an application where people are just sharing information with you and it has nothing to do with a hospital, um, it's probably not subject to HIPAA. Um, but if you're involved with the hospital or anybody else, um, you know, beware. Okay. Thank you. Sure. Um, so the last thing on sort of data de-identification is GDPR doesn't actually define um, anonymizing information or de-identifying it, um, other than to say it's data that's rendered anonymous in such a way that the data subject is not or no longer identifiable. That's pretty much not so helpful in trying to determine what you need to do. Um, but it, there are, like I said, information from the Article 29 Working Party. They have a specific opinion from 2014 on data anonymization. There are also lots of opinions from the European Data Protection Board on the use of AI, the use of surveillance, all kinds of other things related to data privacy. Um, and so um, it's probably outside the and too far into the technical weeds on this, but there are guidelines in all of these laws that kind of establish what you need to do. Um, and there's plenty of sort of scientific research about sort of, you know, the best ways to de-identify information. Um, so in addition to that, you know, a lot of times you'll hear people talk about aggregation of information. Obviously that's not de-identification or anonymization, right? Um, aggregation just means I'm jamming a bunch of information together um, with or without personal data based on smaller data subsets, right? Um, 
aggregating data does not alleviate privacy concerns unless you also anonymize it at the same time, right? So if I obtain, if I'm Salesforce and I obtain a bunch of statistics about, um, you know, how long people are logged into my platform um, and, you know, general number of users in the United States versus in Europe, um, but it doesn't contain any of the underlying information, I've really anonymized that information and aggregated it, right? But aggregation alone does not get you outside of um, privacy regulations. The other sort of interesting sort of we made up a word concept in GDPR is um, the idea of pseudonymization. Um, and um, other than um, having a funny time trying to see other people pronounce the word, um, really what it means under GDPR is you've taken a set of data about uh, people and you've created a separate table um, that allows you to actually re-identify the information, but those two things are kept separate. So if I send a spreadsheet to a vendor um, that has removed enough identifying information so that it's effectively almost re-identified, but I retain a document that says I can re-identify it if I was provided back that information, that's effectively pseudonymization. So it just means the processing of personal data in a way that the data can no longer be attributed to a specific data subject. So it's not de-identified, it just can't be attributed to a specific data subject um, without the use of this additional information that I talked about, which is the cross-reference table. Um, and that's kept separately and is secured so that the, that can't be obtained. Um, the, the idea of pseudonymization is you're adding another layer of protection, but you're not going all the way to the level of de-identification. Um, the sad thing about pseudonymization is it doesn't exempt you from the requirements of GDPR. It still treats that information as personal information, but it does sort of give preferential treatment or sort of credit, shall we say, for using pseudonymized information as opposed to it. So um, if you're engaging cross-border data transfers or using it in the development process, uh, European regulators are going to prefer pseudonymized information over using regular personal information. Um, and then there's differential privacy. Obviously, we had a question about this previously. Um, and really, it's, you know, taking large sets of data, um, introducing statistical noise, and preventing reoccurring uh, queries to prevent large-scale de-identification. And obviously, this is like, it works the best when you have a huge database that has lots of information in it that's about personal, you know, people, um, and you introduce the statistical noise and the limited set of queries so that you can't run a hundred or a thousand queries, get enough underlying information to then de-identify everyone in the data set. Um, and the math on this is way above my pay grade, um, but there's great research and sort of work being done in this area um, about how to sort of do this in a way that protects privacy. Um, the last thing I'll talk about um, is synthetic data. So obviously um, conjuring data or taking data that actually um, is real data and transforming it in a way um, that it retains sort of the relationship and structure of the underlying data, um, but it's effectively de-identified um, is obviously another way in which you can alleviate some of the privacy concerns. If it's not identifiable information and it can't be re-identified, um, and it's running through certain algorithms, then you lower the risk associated with privacy laws and potentially don't have them apply at all. Um, and obviously that's sort of Tonic's uh, fake data game. Um, so there are all these different kinds of ways in which you can kind of lower the risk. Um, and we've got just a few minutes left, so I wanna make sure we leave enough time um, for question and answer. Um, and so what are the goals of all of these techniques? We talked about de-identification and pseudonymization and you know the, the sort of plethora of privacy laws. But really when you're in the development process, you sort of got to ask yourself a question about whether you need the information in the development process or only in the production environment. Um, so if let's say I'm a company and I want to have offshore developers develop software for me, but I don't want to send them personal information while they're programming it or give them access to a database that has real personal information, I can provide them a de-identified data set or a synthetic data set. Um, and that alleviates concerns with underlying companies about providing personal information 
um, in cross-border data transfers. It alleviates the concerns about data localization. Um, and it alleviates the concern that there may be a data breach um, at a third party that involves personal information that would require notice. Um, and so you're really trying to solve for that. And even if you can't de-identify all of the data, obviously you wanna try and minimize as much data as possible that you're providing to lower the overall risk. Um, and you're also trying to sort of avoid the challenges of these privacy laws in general, right? Um, so you wanna prevent, um, the other thing that we have lots of clients get concerned about is, let's say I take a data set and I'm developing an application in the United States and it's about US individuals. And I want to do have a third party do development in Germany. And so I send them my code and I send them the database of US individual information so they can develop the software. Um, if, I, if I move that information into Europe, it's possible that that information then becomes subject to GDPR, even though I'm a US based company. Um, and that's what causes lots of heartburn for people as well. Um, because if somebody made a data subject request or um, in certain instances, that information could be subject to GDPR. And so lots of people don't like that idea. Um, there, it's sort of an open question as to whether it would become subject to GDPR. And so the easier answer is you just don't send them the whole data set or you send them de-identified information and the problem goes away. Um, the other thing is we talked about assisting with privacy risk reduction and breach risk. So the more copies of your database you have in disparate places with developers and other people in your organization, the more breach risk you have. It's just sort of, you know, the attack surface increases. There's more chances for a compromise. Um, and given that supply chain attacks are the sort of uh, big thing in cybersecurity right now. So you know, the SolarWinds attack included attacks on Microsoft and um, a whole bunch of other providers and all of their customers. Um, and a lot of the attackers these days are not trying to go after the company itself, but after their third party providers. So um, uh, reducing the amount of personal information and sensitive information that those providers have will only help you. The other thing is that it probably speeds up the development timeline. If you have to negotiate a large contract with all these privacy protections for offshore development or even onshore development, um, and you have a bunch of privacy risks because there's personal information, it takes longer to negotiate the contract. It requires potentially improvements at the developer, depending on what they're doing. Um, and um, you know, if you if you use a good data set, um, then you can have the same kind of development in a quicker process. Um, the other thing is that um, it allows you to segment data sets for cybersecurity purposes, right? So um, having a de-identified data set um, uh, and keep, keeping that separate from the actual data set is important. You know, the, the normal rule is don't put real data in dev and test environments. Um, don't do it, don't do it, don't do it, unless you absolutely have to. So that segmentation um, allows dev and test environments, which may not be secured as well as your production environment. Hopefully they are, but sometimes they're not. Um, to not have sort of cybersecurity problems. Uh, and then the last thing is um, training AI models without personal information. So, you know, there's a lot of questions about um, data ownership, data feeding into AI models and machine learning, um, and whether or not you can get those models to do what you wanna do with synthetic data or de-identified data. Obviously it's not always gonna work. Um, you may need identifiable information depending on the model. But to the extent that you can train it without that, you may limit some of the implicit bias that's introduced into the AI based on the data set. Um, you may solve for other problems. On the flip side, you may cause other problems if the data set isn't realistic um, or it doesn't actually do um, or, or provide the information enough for the machine learning or AI model to learn what it needs to learn for a decision-making process. Um, so the, the goal obviously is, um, change the paradigm regarding data monetization and data hoarding. Like the United States is like data hoarding number one, like we should be on the show hoarders. Uh, we don't like deleting it. We don't like getting rid of it. Um, and I think that's things, something that people need to resist in the development process. Um, and challenging yourself to think about ways in which development can take place without personal data, right? Um, I talked about the shortened contacting process. Everybody feels better because there's less risk associated 
with the process. If you have to do a data privacy impact assessment, which is sort of an analysis of development and its impact on personal information, it's much simpler if you don't have to talk about the personal information that's involved. Um, and then finally, I just wanna make a few points. Um, you know, if you do have to use personal information in development or in your technology, um, you really should focus on privacy by design. So how do you build in lots of privacy controls and features in the underlying product so that you can meet the requirements of all these privacy laws? The first would be, um, you know, the privacy by design concept itself, um, using encryption at both the storage and field level um, for cybersecurity purposes, building in an audit trail um, so people can tell exactly where um, personal information went and who touched it, um, building in uh, inherent consent mechanisms. So um, instead of having to go back in and reverse engineer, you know, some kind of terms and conditions and checkbox for a person to agree to that, build that into the sort of project itself um, and maybe do it at every screen in which you're collecting personal information. Um, there's a big sort of push for just-in-time privacy notices, which are named after me, of course. Um, and what that means is um, that you tell somebody at the time you're collecting the information exactly why you're collecting it and what you use it for. So, for example, if I have multiple form fields on a particular place, um, when I enter my name or my address, it'll say, we're collecting your address because we needed to do X. And we're collecting your name because we needed to do X. And if I add another data field that says my email address, it says we're collecting your email address because we need to do X, right? The phone number may be to provide to our customer service. So if you call in, we know who you are and the email may be so we can send you a newsletter and updates. Um, but building those things into the project itself and thinking about it when you're designing software, it's so much easier to do these things at the outset than it is to do it afterwards. Um, and the last thing I would say, uh, two things would be, if you can tag fields as either personal or sensitive information, it really helps um, in identifying where the risk is in the organization. So if I need to protect sensitive data in one particular way and personal data, you know, that's just regular personal data in another, if you have data tagging on the fields, obviously you can do that easily in a structured data set. Um, and the last thing would be, you know, role-based access and need to know controls. So not everybody needs access to the personal information, restrict it to as much as possible um, and do the best you can sort of on the development process. And I think that's a lot I just talked about in a short period of time, but I wanna make sure we have some time for Q and A um, and I'll hang around for a little bit if there are questions. Um, I don't know, Kiara, if we've got any that came in. Yeah, yeah, we do. Um, I do have a, a couple that came in and I just wanted to, to thank you. Uh, this has been phenomenal. Um, that, that The list you just outlined right now at the end, I feel like that's that's a blog post in the making, you know, just the how to and, and what you should attack first. Um, that actually is one of the questions that, that came through was what would you suggest as the first step uh, for a company looking to organize its approach to data governance for the future of data privacy regulations? Like, like we said, these aren't going away and chances are a federal law will come out um, sooner or later. So, yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think, um, you know, the, the, our, our first step is always uh, do data mapping, understand where the data is coming in, where is it going um, and what controls you have in place. Um, and then kind of do a gap. The, the second step is do a gap analysis. What you're, what are you cur currently doing and how is that measured against the privacy laws that you're subject to? And then you kind of take that and meld it into um, a privacy framework that you implement um, company-wide based on your current practices. And then you kind of just elevate everything up to that privacy framework. Um, and we think if you generally just adhere to the concepts of transparency, notice, you know, consent, um, and uh, honesty and data ethics when you're sort of programming things and trying to get your organization to be privacy aware, um, that goes a long way in making a regulator happy um, because obviously most of this is doing two things. One, making sure you don't get in trouble under the law, but two, uh, taking care of the people whose information that you're collecting and having respect for the information that you're collecting from them. Um, 
I always say like if you're doing things with data that if you was published on the Wall Street Journal front page or the New York Times front page, you'd be very, very ashamed of um, because you're not telling people about it. That's what's going to get you in trouble with a regulator or the FTC. Um, and people will forgive you if you tell them what you're doing, even if they don't like it. Um, they just don't want to be lied to or things left out. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Um, another question for you, you know, you are a CISO yourself, and I know that GDPR requires some companies to hire or name a, a data protection officer. How, what is the overlap between those roles? Um, are they both necessary? Can they be the same person? Yeah, our normal recommendation is don't have your CISO be your DPO um, because they have two different sort of roles. Um, and, you know, th this is sort of goes back to the idea that like cybersecurity and data privacy are two different things now. They're not overlapping. Um, and data privacy is sort of what you collect, um, how you use it and who you share it with. And cybersecurity is just about like securing the information from unauthorized disclosure um, and the confidentiality, integrity and availability of the information. But the most important thing is you can't have privacy without security, right? You have to secure the information or it can't be private. So um, they're necessarily intertwined and security is a step in the privacy process. So normally we say pick a completely separate individual. If you don't have anybody with experience, you can you know, find an outside counsel like our firm or anybody else um, who has privacy experience and have an outsourced DPO who can handle privacy things for you. Um, but I would separate those functions and the other thing is that, you know, privacy is an organization wide um, impetus. Um, and if you just push that off on the IT department, along with cybersecurity and all the other stuff, you're kind of missing a lot of what privacy requires. Um, and normally we would say it's more important to have it be somebody in the administration of the company who has a good relationship with IT than vice versa. Okay. Interesting. A couple more questions for you if you're, if you're able to stay on the line. Sure. So much of the language of these regulations feels open to a degree of interpretation. There's cannot be reasonably identified, no reasonable basis to believe. How glaring does a privacy violation have to be for it to result in fines? Um, that's a great question. And uh, I would be the first to admit, like, even as a lawyer working in this space, like a lot of times it's sort of clients ask questions. I'm like, I don't know. It says like, you know, reasonable this or reasonable that. I think the answer is, um, most regulators will forgive you if you're trying, right? If you're taking steps to comply with the law or you're doing the best you can to comply with the law as you understand it and you've you know, coordinated with an attorney or you have sort of like an opinion that says, look, this is what we're trying to do or how we're documenting our efforts, you're unlikely to get really whacked with a fine. Um, the, the exception might be GDPR because some of those regulators um, you know, are out to prove a point. But even there, our general understanding from all of our European colleagues and, and in my personal experiences, if you show good faith efforts and after they notify you of it, if you try and correct the problems, you're very unlikely to get an extremely large fine. Um, the exception to that would be in a data breach. Um, you know, if you didn't have reasonable security measures, you may get whacked around a little bit and you could get sued by a whole bunch of people too, which is always very fun. Yeah, that's true. Do you have any predictions around um, when we may have a U.S. federal law? Yeah, my answer to this is um, keep wishing. Um, I just don't think the, you know, legislative bodies of the United States federal government can really get their act together to pass one. There have been a ridiculous number of proposals um, and they've gone absolutely nowhere. Um, I would think if we continue to see state level laws at some point in time, we may get a critical mass. Um, but the concern I think for most people is even if there's a federal law, I think the major assumption from a lot of privacy practitioners is it will not preempt other state laws. It will just set the floor. And then if a state wants to have more onerous privacy provisions, they can. And that's the way that HIPAA works, that's the way that GLBA works. So there are more restrictive, you know, financial privacy laws in California than Graham Leach Bliley, and that's permissible. Um, and there's no federal data breach notification law. There are ones that are in certain regulations, but they don't necessarily preempt other ones. 
So I think there's a, the, the reason why that is just for making this explanation longer is states make money off of privacy regulation. Um, and they, they think that the requirement should be higher than what they think the federal government would require. So they don't want to give up the local control of privacy effectively. Interesting. So this patchwork quilt is not like going away. This patchwork quilt is here to stay. That's my personal opinion. Um, I'm happy to be wrong on this because it would make my life and my clients' lives much simpler. Um, I guess it's job security, but um, I, I, I would be very surprised in the next two to five years if we really get a comprehensive federal level privacy law. Okay, interesting. Well, I think that's a great question to end on unless anyone has anything else to add. Um, did you want to click forward one more slide? I think we've got our contact oh, yep. information. That's great. Um, yeah, yeah, so if you'd like, oh, please go ahead. No, go ahead, go ahead. No, if you'd like to reach out to either of us, you've got our contact information right there. You can contact Justin directly uh, at his email, or if you have any questions around, um, I didn't mention this earlier, but differential privacy, uh, synthetic data, that is you know, tonics bread and butter. So if you have deeper technical questions in that area, we're happy to answer them. Um, thank you so much, Justin. This was, this was awesome. Uh, I feel, I learned a lot and I think that it was so beneficial for, for everyone who, who called in. Thank you, Justin. Okay. Thanks, everybody. Thanks, Kiara. I really appreciate it. Thanks for your time. Thank you.